Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last news of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalever, but we must talk about right now the majestic giraffe, Josef Mengel. Oh, Daddy Mengel. Hauptabteilungsleiter für Afrikanische Politik of Reichskommissar at Africa, essentially acting as a foreign minister, just took his leave from Mueller on the helipad after an important meeting. They shook each other's hand when throttled rancor palpable in the doctor's eyes. Or with throttled rancor. It was merely a boring meeting about some already doomed treaty, but this snob played himself like an exalted representative. Thus, Mueller examined the brought gift after the obnoxious man's vehicle was nowhere to be seen anymore, and its quickly recognizable green pattern gave him a much more exciting thought immediately. A hunt! And the remote office at a certain place stopped. He pondered over the map where every mark of the scouts had made was centerized or centralized for posterity. He swiftly identified the two spots he preferred for the plentifulness of the animal he wanted to hunt. He had to choose where he'd have the most luck with a giraffe. Unfortunately, the most impressive examples were predominantly found in Hutig's Ost Africa. On the one end, there was Serengeti. A fly would take him beyond yet another lake and deep into Ost Africa's north. The idyllic savanna with its prominent grass landscapes would certainly find him an impressive savanna. On the other hand, this choice fell on Ak Akagara, located before the aforementioned lake, yet similarly within Hutix Rocks Commissariat. Not too dissimilar from the Serengeti, the giraffe was also to be found here in plenty as well. He now, though, had to choose where he'd hunt the giraffe. However, he had to keep in mind where he was going. Hans Hutig was anything but friendly towards Müller, and it wasn't unlikely this hunt would see him stirring up the most dangerous predator on the African continent. So, like with the other ones from yesterday, we're going to choose whatever one, and if we fail, we fail, but we might try him again since we do have a lot of political power. Even though, like right now, the native tension is kind of high, and investors are unhappy, which is... Both are not good to have, so it is what it is. Um, Deep in the horn says even deeper. Let's go even deeper. Which is the correct thing to do. Go even deeper. The equipment. Uh, let's see. If you want to read about this stuff, please go right ahead. This is pretty normal. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mueller now wondered what he could slay such a big, majestic, big, big, majestic creature like with, with like a giraffe with. On the other hand, he also had to keep in mind that he was very much preparing to leave his comfort zone. Modern and swift, forty-four percent. The hunt is ready. Uh, let's see, if you want to read about this, uh, I can probably read about this one, so. At least a top paragraph. The Reichskommissar was taking the last sip of, from his favorite drink before making everything ready for the departure. Rolf Steiner, who was also attending the meeting with Mengel, much to his distaste, recommended taking the flight from here for potential safety reasons. Furthermore, he planned a helicopter route that would lead through the territory who took at least control of. Ha! There was a lot to choose from in that regard. He just hoped that those darn partisans wouldn't meddle with his hut. Mueller went around the Hitlerstadt garrison to gather a crew of the most experienced scouting corps members and ex excellent marksmen, completing his crew by including his personal guests and guards. There, there's, there, this time, there were neither natives nor mercenaries allowed. He needed absolute unyielding trust in his crew. Everything was pretty much ready. The Rockskomosor rubbed his hands at the thought of slaying a majestic giraffe soon. He pictured it right in front of him, aiming at the spe speckled fur of this tall creature with its filigree head on an enormous neck. Him approaching after the deadly blow and fascinated by the exalted air aura, it would soon radiate in his grand collection. However, this hunt had to be accounted for from mul multiple factors, certainly. The general rush wouldn't be solely incited by what he was hunting, rather where. This time, the horns stayed silent. 44% is pretty good. And we also probably need to do the next one anyways. Uh, we're doing stuff over here, so let's go ahead with our very own airfields to please investors. Air power in Africa has traditionally been Shanks' prerogative, with Central Africa's Air Force mainly consisting in smaller helicopter squadrons for Mueller's private use in his hunting expeditions. In recent years, however, air transport is slowly replacing other forms of travel as the most time and cost efficient. The steady increases in, increase in air traffic and the interest some of our investors have expressed means Central Africa can no longer depend on its southern brother and instead needs to establish its own air service. The first step is actually building new airstrips and all necessary infrastructure. Very good. And going to the savannah. We're finally closing in, Rex Komosaw. Finally, the pilot's word saved him from completely drifting into the heavens of hunts. Excitedly, he grabbed for the supporting bars and positioned himself on the skids. Windy air blowing across his face, the helicopter darted between him, or between and above the mountains of Rwanda. Over the trees and small farms that dotted the landscape, this was to avoid any attention from Ost Africa's radar system, since this visit was technically unauthorized. The helicopter soared, ahead was Akagata, an expansive mixture of montane, swamp, and savanna in eastern Rwanda, named after the Kagera River, which flowed along its eastern boundary into a system of lakes and papyrus, papyrus swamps. With a massive diversity of wildlife, it made perfect sense for the Belgian to once declare it a wildlife sanctuary. Maybe it still was. Mueller had in check. Not that he cared, of course. One of his companions, of course, joined him on the skids and said, How do you want to proceed? You've gathered essential details by now. Giraffe shouldn't be hard to see, even from a great height. A fine question, to be sure. Should they fly lower for a closer look, or will that give away the element of surprise? Uh, I think they're pretty fast, aren't they? And I think, if I remember correctly, a random fact about giraffes, I think they give birth standing up, so. Um, shouldn't be too hard to see. Stay high, fly. Yep, stay high, fly. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
Oh, well, well Siegfried Müller had already been nervously fidgeting on his seat within the helicopter cabin. He was checking both equipment and terrain over and over again. Already rushed with adrenaline, he made sure the pilots were keeping tight and the sentinels on the skids weren't missing any Ost African outposts. However, they found something else. They found the true purpose of the hunt. A group of tail, tall and majestic giraffes grazing between a set of savannah trees, their sh shading crowns, delivering the perfect image of what Africa was all about. Müller was silent for a minute, reminiscent of all his hunt priors. There was almost a tiny spark of regret that he had brutally destroyed such beautiful scenarios before, but no. He reminded himself that his hunting trophies, or his hunting trophies, were pet perpetual captions of these sceneries. He firmly took the rifle and silently barked orders to put his decided and silently barked orders to put his decided on method of approach strategy into action. That's not a very good sentence. The big bodies gracefully moved to take their nibbles on the grass. Yum yum. Movements that made Müller grin before he started aiming in his opted position. He hovered over the majestic animals with his reticle for some time. Finally, he chose which one he'd go for. He had a desired target. The bystanding giraffes were nothing to him. Now he had forgot everything around him. The environment around him dissolved into pure concentration on this particular animal. Eventually, he closed his eyes and counted one, counted down three, two, one. Uh, we got it! Yeah, we got it! The bullet flew and directly went through the animal's chest, potentially destroying its heart. It collapsed to the front, bending in a very grotesque manner. Blood flooded onto the grass, while the other giraffes escaped, desperate to survive. One of the giraffes attempted to flee, but was horribly penetrated by several bullets, yet succeeded to ultimately heave itself to safety. The other two escaped nearly unharmed. The deed was done, the victory Mullers. He was even surprised himself how smoothly went it all, how it all went down. Now it's about time to claim the trophy. They approached the dead animal on the ground. Step after step, Müller's grin widened. He was happy beyond belief. He had only slain one giraffe once, very early in his Reichskommissar ship. He had hunted them after a meeting in Salisbury without permission. While Hutig actually could, ne could have never known about it since the Reichskommissarats were still in the build-up, he made some queer comments about the giraffe at their next meeting. He probably knew this time as well. This time there was an intrusion on top. Müller quickly gave the orders to help him cut out the trophy. He wanted to be out of Ost Africa as swiftly as possible. With the hunt over, he started to be wary again. He just hoped Hutig's response wouldn't be unreasonable and rash. Accidents happen where Hutig reigns. Yeah, accidents. Accidents, my friends. Accidents. In the palace, the Reichskommissar was glad to have safely returned at the governing complex for some time during the flight. He felt the thought of anxiety flooding his emotions. He watched. Uh, he felt watched, followed after, but what should have happened? Who took himself would never arrange that accidental shooting of a Zentro Afrikaner helicopter that bore the marks of, a higher, of the higher echelons? Yet on the other hand, he shook it all away. Instead, he focused on finding the perfect positioning for this majestic trophy, including parts of the giraffe's long neck. It was the largest so far, thus the options were limited. Once hooked up, Müller again proudly contemplated the hunts. By now, he had come to the realization that the hunting season wouldn't allow for many more impressive trophies. The grand collection would have to wait for a few months, but the occasional casual hunt wouldn't have to. All prior trophies standing witness, he swore to continue the grand collection to capture the African wildlife in all plenty, as soon as the consultations would align again. While he patted the giraffe's long neck with, a sa with absent thoughts, a clerk entered the room hastily. A call for the Reichskommissar from the General Bureau for Ost Afrikanische Müller cut him off with a nervous gaggle or giggle, very unlike the usual Jogo many we came to love. Bad word, indeed, secret bad word. So now we can do this, and we're doing this one right now. And we're, I, you know what? Screw the investors, screw the natives. Well, maybe literally do that. But what I want to do is see if we can get this stuff done. Now, someone did leave a comment from the last video saying that we should, I should check out the guide someone else has made to get this done. But we'll see about that. We're gonna try this, but I'm gonna make sure if we can't do this successfully, we'll just keep going on. And if we can be successful with it, well, you'll see in just a moment. And here we have it, everyone. The elephant, we got it. The bullets flew everywhere, an orgy of blood, gore, soot, and dead animals. Most of the younglings had collapsed by the time Müller and his veterans shot, sent shot after shot into the flesh of the mightiest of them. Shot after shot, it rose and sank down again, struggling with an unyielding will to survive. Everyone had reloaded by this point. Müller even thought about going for the head, but he didn't want to have a smirch his trophy. It finally fell for the last time in a long, drawn-out act of what could have been a staged death in a Shakespearean drama, not that he ever read or saw one, but he imagined them like that. Finally, the dust settled. They made their tallies to the ground on the ground. The female was about to flee out of their heiress eyesight when the predators appeared and slew the beast in a few shots. After adding her bloodied ivory to the reservoir, they greeted Müller with a bunch of smaller and bigger par partially red-colored tusks backpacked. He had slain only one of these mighty creatures, yet he had slain the biggest and wouldn't give the slightest soul of it away. Though they arrogantly asked for his acquired tusks, he sent them toward the young, killed younglings. Mila quickly took hold of one of the tusks and made certain they were his, engraving a small sick feet on one of them. Now he ordered the veterans to help him finally claim his trophy. Lots of cutting began. Cut, 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 cut! Oh. 
The head was carried back in the hall, Mueller standing by the all by all the while to make sure it was in perfect condition. The equally immense and impressive head with these huge tusks would fit his collection excellently. Excellently, Mueller was overexcited to have his visitors gaze under the importance of that his collection now hoist, hosted, thanks to the elephant's gargantuan head. The grand collection finally developing and shaping up to becoming something, and the head of the mightiest of the African wildlife complemented each other flawlessly. The Afri elephant's head promised to get. To let any visitor feel small and lost compared to its monstrous size. He looked at the head before its positioning, made some small adjustments to the trophy, and began instructing the concierges. The Reich's commissar crossed his arms and proudly contemplated his work. He had slain the beast. What a story to tell. No one could see could even flee it without the magnificent elephant's head hanging there to force even the shyest visitor to ask for a hunting story. The imposing look let the Reich's commissar drift into Hunter's fantasy, being rushed with adrenaline if, if, as if he was hunting the beast all over again. The next hunt was already in the making and a mobile to say say so called spider near Bangui. At such dire times as these within the German administered sections of Africa, it's rare that we receive good news regarding our fight against the vicious savage partisans, however. One such notification did recently reach the desk of the Rex Commissar, specifically that famed partisan and terrorist Mambotsu Sese Seku, who has been spotted near Bangui in the northern colony, or the northeast of the colony. Born Joseph Desiree Mobutu, Sese Soko was, jo was joined or joined the Central African SS at an early age and quickly earned a reputation for his intelligence, leadership, and fervor. Mobutu seemed des destined to rise as high as his race would permit him until he unexpectedly vanished into the jungle along with his entire unit and vast quantities of arms and ammo. Shortly after, he changed his name and developed a different reputation, one of the most ruthless and capable insurgent warlords in the region. While many of the rebels proclaim allegiance to Bolshevism, democracy, or one of the many pithy ethnic groups per perpetuating squabbling for prominence, Mom Boltu appears to fight only for himself. His fighters are famed for greed and steal whatever they can find from German colonists and African natives alike. Many of our best men have been hunting Mobutu for months. That is that he has been spotted at last suggested that the ground might be finally be sinking, shrinking beneath his feet. We can only hope that this dire threat to our interests will finally become eliminated. The traitor better stay hidden, and before we do that, hog, look at this beautiful. This is so good. The giraffe, that massive elephant. Oh, this is nice. This is very nice. All right, everyone. So here we are. We got it. But before we read this, I do want to let you know, I had used cons commands and gave myself like 75 political power just to repeat the same hunting thing over and over again until we actually got it. So just let you be, just let you guys be aware. I did use like, uh, this, this thing over here. I gave myself political power over here just to try it out like, oh, 50 political power. So just to be open with you guys. The bullet head, the river hogs humped back in an ensuing feast of blood and gore. The beast wasn't felled immediately, still trying to stand up while the other creature took to the flight. It was shot time and time again. The hoglets were shrieking and running everywhere, miraculously dodging the bullets all the while. Just in the vicinity of Mueller's ear, sh another shot was fired, swiftly pursued by another. He himself shot again as well, delivering the ultimate blow. Most of the hoglets and the other adult hogs were gone by now, and the desired target finally collapsed. They approached and did an animal on the ground. Step after step, Mueller's grin widened. Barely a meter apart from it, he clearly at least shot in the air as a hobbinger of his overexcitement. He hadn't slain such a big hog in a long time, and this particularly rare specimen's impressive head was about to adorn the halls of his palace and bestow upon it some more grandeur. Mueller quickly got hold of his senses again. He tried to lift up the hog, but needed one helping hand for that. That one was big. Just a perfect for a trophy. Perfect. And I do apologize for using cons commands, but, you know, I wanted to get this one done, so... In the palace, there lay flawless and with an awkward beauty that only a hunter could perceive. Mueller rested his hand on the lifeless head. The orange bristles felt special, and he loved the feeling of them tickling his skin. It was reassuring to press his hand on this brutish animal's head soon. This head of, an of ambivalence and extravagance would embellish the halls of his trophy room. He waited while the responsible concierges were informed. He looked at the collection and found the perfect positioning for this beauty. The Rex Commissar crossed his arms and proudly contemplated his work. He had slain this robust creature. He laughed with satisfaction how he finally had the trophy hanging that he desired just a few days ago. What a story to tell. No one could flee it now with the big creature's head begging to have this story told. The fine look reminded him of how many of Africa's finest creatures he already encountered, and how many of the palace's visitors will soon encounter. And Mueller won't stop now. Look at that. Now now we did I didn't want to use cons commands, but you know what, I'd rather use cons commands to get things done like this than anything else. That is beautiful. I love it. I love hunting down in uh, Central Africa, even though it's sometimes not great. Kind of buggy. Away from Windhook. After that, let's see. Ask investors to raise steel quotas. Eh, blood diamonds. Yeah, why not? Diamond trade is undoubtedly the most profitable activity in Central Africa. From dozens of mines all across the Congo Basin, everyday crates and crates of these stones are extracted by the tireless efforts of tens of thousands of men, women, and children working to their death in dark, airless pits. Diamonds are all so beautiful, white and transparent as a child's innocent, and shining with the colors of a rainbow. How is it possible for them to still be so pristine when they are bathed in so much blood? How can they be a symbol of purity when just looking at them makes them even the most sane man want to kill? How can they be a symbol of love when they can make a part, part, person's heart just as hard as they are? But they are so precious. Oh yes, so precious. Away from Windhook. 
The dense forest and curve of the airfield sloped away from the windows of the cockpit, and a pilot noted the beauty of the scene with a clinical gaze. He had no time to play observer or cameraman. Today's flight would end at a destination he'd never seen before, and a coordinates that was unfamiliar with, tapping the gauges of his fuel meter. They never found the last one who found his tank empty over the lake. He prepared himself to fly over the vast expanse of Windhoek to the nameless field in Central Africa. He was quite frankly surprised when the request filtered in from the HQ. Miller was far more preoccupied with aerial vehicles than he had to get aim from, so why bother investing in a substantial air force at all? He supposed even a man as headstrong as the Reich's Commissar wasn't immune to fears of NATO simply shooting him out of the sky as he played hunter atop a helicopter. Either way, as one of the senior airmen in the Sudvest West African Air Force, or force, he'd been sent a sh as a show of goodwill, and a also a convenient gesture towards retirement in all probability. But this is no time for speculation. He went over the maneuvers and training patterns he could dredge up for the depth of his mind and past, techniques learned in distant Germany half a lifetime ago. There would be a little rest from this point onwards. Now he had a class to teach, and if the reports sent from Leopoldville were accurate, it would pay, or would be, the largest single class he'd ever taught. He just wished they'd pay him something more for babysitting. Interesting. Cool. Awesome. We love Blood Diamonds. Mercenary Industries? Oh, yeah, that actually be pretty good. More military factories. I like that one. Listen to industries. Risking your life every day in a jungle filled with disease, diseases and rebels war and some kind of reward. The mercenaries employed by the rich corporate tycoons to protect their activities all across Central Africa have amassed a substantial amount of wealth during the service and reinvested it in the several industrial enterprises which now are almost entirely owned by mercenary corporations. In order to keep them close to us and loyal to the government, investments and subsidies oh, will target these activities, keeping the well-earned retirement benefits of these, work, of these warriors safe, of course. Lex Komosari expects him to remember this service in the future. Cool. Now, th this will displease investors, but you know what? We're already pleasing them a little bit. Uh, native attention is a little high, and they're unhappy. What we're trying to do stuff here for them. We really are. I want to invite people. Oh, let's do this as well. Honey season's over for now, so. For now. We'll come back to it later, though. Nice. Very, very good. Very, very good. Alright, we still have 40 PP. 0.67 a day is not great, but we'll take it. Um, we could really piss off the natives if we really wanted to do stuff like this. Greatly raise native tension, but the investors will really like this. Or we could do this one. Greatly raise the native tension, investors will really like this decision too. Dear Mother, accepting to work in the diamond mines was the worst mistake I have ever done in my life. I should have trusted you when you told me that the factor was lying and that I should have, shouldn't believe his promises just after I had my happy night with my brother spending on our gain paycheck. We were both put like cat on the back of a Volkswagen truck for three days until we reached the month, but it was only the beginning of our nightmare. We slept on the floor and of the tent, and by the earliest ray of sunshine, sunlight, we were awoken up by the foreman and made to work like slaves until the sun went down. After that, we were forced by the guards to strip down and be searched to see if we were not hiding a diamond. Our every move was watched by white men with guns who yelled and beat us, telling us to work harder. If we did not do as they, they say, they would whip us or even shoot our hands. One day, one of the mine's pit was collapsing and one of the guards ordered my brother to go retrieve a gas can which was left there. He refused at first but the man pushed him down. Joseph got the can but could not escape in time. I couldn't even give Joseph a decent bureau as a foreman made me go back to work and that day I knew I could not work in the same mine no more. I picked up an SS Ascati uniform from someone who owed me a favor then escaped the mine after stealing the diamonds from the company safe now. I'm hiding in one small house with everyone in Kasai looking for me and a bounty on my head. Mother, I need you to open the teddy bear I sent you then use it to hire one of those pilots that hang around Leopoldville Airport to come to Mbui Mai. Rescue me and then fly away to Liberia. Mother, we can get out of this place, go away from the Germans and the Belgians, go to America to live like those like like in those movies in the theater you worked back when I was little. With hope, Joseph's death will not be in vain. Your loving son, Jonathan. Money. We can do that, but I want to please investors. They're displeased. Oh boy. You know, they're displeased. Maybe we should have do blood diamonds. Oh, this one, yeah. We did blood diamonds, which is fine. Um... Increased exploitation. Central Africa is tremendously rich in raw materials, with gold, silver, iron, copper, diamonds, and rubies made seemingly popping out of nowhere. With the mainland Reich in constant need of new resources to reverse the economic downturn, the government in Germany and Müller's corporate friends here will surely appreciate an increase in extraction activities all throughout the Reich's Commissariat. Of course, this would mean infecting hundreds of natives and taking away from them the means to ensure their own survival. The cost on lives would be high, but it's a small price to pay for the Reich's greatness. If that's the case, let's go ahead and, and sell equipment to the natives to lower their displeasure first, maybe? Um, yeah, let's, just, let's at least get that guaranteed. So now they're status quo, and next one we'll do is investors. Because I would do this one too, so expand the Leopold Vale Airport. 
Before the new focus on air power, Leopoldsville's small and obsolete airport was the only airship in all of Central Africa, mainly receiving the few civilian flights which kept the Reichskommissariat connected to the wider Reich. Now that an actual airfield network is being established, Leopoldsville shall become the main hub of increasingly frequent air traffic. With its doubled strips and more than three times its original docks, a dedicated military service wing in the main building designed by architects from Germania, the new Letel Vorbeck Airport will be the jewel of our air service. Even the placid shank will be green with envy. Very nice. Nice. Very, very good. I wish we could get... Uh, actually, we could probably spend some money now. That's fine. Spend some money on our GDP. That's fine. Um, I wish we had more PP, though. But this is just beautiful. Look at all this stuff. Ah, uh, so majestic. So nice. And it's all ours. Status quo. Displeased. Angering these guys will have a negative impact on our economy, and if we anger them too much, they will pull their support from the colony. So we're done with the natives. Oh, no, no, we need as much people. We don't do that. We lose quite a bit of it, so. Keep them happy, keep them happy, keep them happy. And the road to Cabinda. And it please the investors, which would be nice. Very, very nice. And about three days left. We could do this stuff, prepare the hunt and stuff like this. Um, Yeah, I don't know. That stuff seems okay. Well, maybe we'll be able to get to this, but we'll see what happens. Vast amounts of land sold. A handshake, a signature, several thousands of acres of jungle near Stanleyville change hands. Previously had been under the official ownership of the government, though who it really belonged to had been under the dispute since the time immemorial. But now had gone to a rubber firm. The province offers very little in terms of industrial potential, but is renowned as a source of natural rubber. This suits the rubber corporation who bought it just fine. They plan to turn the jungle into a vast series of plantations to bring the rubber to market. Very good. Over in the provinces of Umbomu. Mbomu. An agreement with the food manufacturer been made to provide a vast area of land that will be turned into a palm oil farms. The palm oil finds its way into the kitchens and bakeries of the world, netting the Belgian company that farms it and the Reichskommissariat a healthy sum of money. Not all the land is going to be used to produce goods. In Bumba, a lodging concern has decided to directly compete with Hitlerstadt and provide their own accommodations, utilizing the nearby Buta airport to bring in travelers from across the world. They have purchased a massive swath of beach there, as well as a few outlying islands. There they will place hotels, motels, resorts, vacation homes, timeshares, anything to cater to the expected massive throngs of people who seek a tropical and exotic destination. It seems Central Africa has found a new use for the large amount of land that exists on the east side of the Congo Lake, and that use seems to be whatever the Belgians want with it. It doesn't matter, as long as they get far more money than selling it, than just sitting on it. And in the end, everyone's happy with these arrangements. Nice. A small amount of money will enter our roads, or monies, but the Cabinda. The northernmost tip of the old Portuguese Angola, separated from the rest of the colony by the Belgian Congo, now part of Central Africa. As the Rex Commissari, that's the main source of oil. As a newly established air service needs a constant supply of fuel, a reliable source is of, of the utmost importance. With financial backing from some friends in the oil shipping companies, a new pipeline will be built, directly connecting Cabinda... To our new to our refiners in Hitlerstadt and Leopoldville for now. It will mostly operate for civilian use, but in case of a war, it will immediately be put under full military control. A new tarmac for the Leopoldville Airport. Leopoldville is a city of wide open streets and clean buildings. The Belgians made sure the streets were wide enough for instant crowd control if necessary, and the Central African administration has continued that policy. This has resulted in a more or less half empty city, with the occasional expatriate driven automobile a rare sight on the weekday and an occasional sight on the weekend. But today, the streets heading south are packed. Leopoldville Airport is opening up an expansion for civilian and military usage. Miller himself has volunteered to lead the opening ceremony, although his mildly bored expression suggests that he's begun to regret the decision. He begins by making a short speech about how Central Africa's development has always been reliant on the benevolence of the Greater Reich and how their leadership has led the way for all civ citizens of Leopoldville and the German Congo to follow. It's clear he's reading off a script without much enthusiasm. Then he segues into describing the civilian applications of the airport, and it soon is clear that the ceremony will last far beyond the initial hour. He regales the audience with tales of how his gunships have given him the platform to hunt down nearby or nearly every type of beast in the Congo and soon pivots through his favorite gauntlet of hunting trips, including that time he nearly ended up dead by the hooves of a feared white rhino on a trip to Italian East Africa, and his aides have heard this story so many times there's an office pool on the time if, of its next retelling. As the audience begins to nod off in boredom, an aide hurriedly ushers him off stage and reminds the audience to sign a Rex Commissariat donation pledge on the way out and declares the airport officially open. It sounds like it sounds like he's just like asking people to uh, like donate to his Patreon like in Rex Commissariat in Central Africa. That'd be funny. Ah, classic Müller. So, we do need to keep in mind, it is October 63, so things are not going to go well in Germania. Um, they're still so displeased, and I want to buy this 1% here. Maybe we get Ricard Kasolowski. Yeah. He's not well-known by the public, he's one of our main investors. Uh, well, attract the attention, though, but that will piss off investors, it might. But this will please investors. Ooh, we might want to wait, then. 
I want to I want to get people complete or you know love investors. Automobile, the banker, the planner. Someone did say we should get the cosmonaut, but I'm not sure there's a cosmonaut here, is there? Should be a junior. Um. A peaceful day in October. A clerk came storming into the Rex Commissar's office, nearly breaking it off its hinges. It came to a puffing stop while documents flew around from the table by the, by the heavy smoke created. Steiner and his superior were just casually discussing a report regarding an American corporation when this happened. Mueller, who was rarely confused, lost all his words in that instance for an unusual solace. I, the clerk began to say, I am, <clears throat> he caught his breath, an imminent report from Germania. Yeah, Commissar, Rex Commissar. He finally managed to say, despite its obvious flurry. Mueller was even more confused about that, wrinkling his forehead to herald his inquiry. I didn't, don't expect anything. What do you mean by an imminent? Steiner took on a concerned expression when he saw the clerk struggle to put it into words. Once again, it took a few attempts before it came out, the messenger already bathing in sweat. It's a fear. He has died. A deeper sigh than the Congo Lake made his relief of finally having to deliver the message obvious. Rolf Steiner bent back in his chair and inhaled uneasily. He exhaled thoughtfully while massaging his brows in solemn demeanor. Goth Vedant, he waved the quivering clerk away. This is a disaster. We can merely surmise what might happen to the Reich. Then Mueller took the word quite undisturbed. I don't understand your extremeness, he shrugged. Everyone dies. I'll die too. Eventually, just as well as you. We might as well just leave a different legacy, but it, we might live on if we choose so. Someone will carry on for us. He took a sip of his drink. Yeah, Hitler's legacy is something else. At least they let us believe so. However, even Alexander the Great and Napoleon died, the conquerors Hitler imitated. Standard nodded soberly. I don't fear for the man, I fear for the empire. Everything passes over time. Oh boy. Oh boy. Hitler's dead, but maybe we can still invite somebody here. Because I don't want them to be too displeased. Because they're still displeased. And the natives, they're always they're always running amok. I don't care. You know, the natives are always going to be unhappy no matter what, so. If they're always going to be unhappy, should we give them any, you know, any love? Probably not. Oh, hold on. Oh, now, god dang, it's lagging now. Oh, we, oh. As soon as we got 75, 76 political power, I should have been a little bit faster. We could have invited some some other guy. Oh, oh, we still can maybe. Turn situation still fine. Oh, ah, we can't invite anybody. But at least we have PP. We might need more PP though. Oh. If not complete within 30 days, the resources we have bought from Germany will be gone. What? 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 Um. That's really bad, actually. That's extremely bad. We're doing so well, though. In the dock of the bay. Captain Philip Schaefer stood on the deck of Z-722, Orkad das Lohenzers. Lovens has, gazing smilingly at the ships me meandering into port. They came from all over the Reich, uh, stacking their holes with Central Africa's raw bounty for the pack's insatiable factories and people. There were vessels too, other vessels too, he noticed. Plenty of Italian and Iberian ones, one or two from Japan, and another seemed to hoist Indian flags, and that one, he frowned. Schaefer thought that he remembered the ship from somewhere, one stack, one superstructure. Two masts forward, one aft, but it couldn't be that type. That was an American one. Just to make sure, he took out his binoculars and took a look. No flag on that one stern the name. A chill went up his spine as he remembered where he had seen last seen the ship. The same signs, even. He was younger back then, a couple of pay grades lower. It was in the southern Atlantic through a pair of binoculars. It was in the middle of the North Atlantic through a periscope. He only had a moment to focus on it before the captain ordered a crash dive to save the boot from the salvo of depth charges. Now he had time to focus on it as long as he needed. His first thought was to call it in, but then he quashed his the breath in his throat. Schaefer heard rumors that Americans were coming in with the Reichskommissar's permission, blowing his whistle now might end his career. And as he thought about it, why should he go after the vessel? It was here to do business like everyone else, no more, no less. America and Germany were at peace now. Perhaps his vessel's mission would bring the two nations a bit closer, a bit further than those battle days so long ago. And let it continue forevermore. How do we complete this? We'll be gone? Uh, or maybe this one has to go first. We bought a lot of stuff, so... Oh! Cameroon, African state. Oh, oh, why are we in edit mode? What the heck? Cool. The Reich has collapsed. Siegfried Müller was walking up and down along the handrail of his vast balcony. Oh, crap. Um, occasionally stopping to bend over and nervously tap his feet. He already told Stein in a hurry. Just a few moments ago was only a mild nervosity when he sent Müller to inquire at a high command in Germania into the sudden fading of the occasional orders. But now, he was certainly becoming the worried... Becoming worried that he had time to ponder about the true consequences of Hitler's death. He heard a dull noise through the curtains to the balcony and immediately made his way inside. There you are. What took you so long? 
Steiner's deep, deep frown surely wasn't the harbinger of good news. The high command at Germania was in all a frenzy. They aren't even sure of themselves what's going on down in the capital, but he bit his lip. Well, most of the high command has collapsed, just as the Ark is itself. Mass desertions, troop movements, vast protest rallies, the exchange of shots between fellow brethren, they're speaking of a civil war. Müller put his hands on the back of his head, raised brows, and somberly stared at the ceiling. It was a long, drawn minute of silence. Both men's thoughts processes were palpably heating the already hot air. Scheiße, Müller finally said. Gott verdammt scheiße. He took a seat, still pondering on. What are we supposed to do now? If Krab's gone down to the Father Land, it'll soon be in the whole of the Reich. It's bad enough that we lost the High Command, but even worse is what's going to happen here. The Partisans, the Investors, the Shipments, and Hutig. That's the only tip of the iceberg. I don't even dare imagine the many things that could set us ablaze now. Steiner pressed his lips tight. So it begins. We have to prepare for anything by this point. I'm glad we got rid of that other focus. We got that one done. I got rid of it, but... Also, Africa proposes the sh Africa Shield. Mueller clipped Rex Komasa Hutig. Hans, Mueller replied. His voice flickered on and off from the speaker. I'll keep this brief. You've heard of the situation in Germania. Who hasn't? Then I propose an alliance until it passes. What's in it for a son? Hutig drew in a breath. It'll do him no good to lash out now. Your mercenaries can pillage something larger than elephant herds and jungle salvages. I'll get the boys strapped up. Good. Perhaps there was, was still hope for him yet. We'll speak again in seven days. Now hold the F. Click. And that was that. The road to Cabina. The owner of the Cabina oil field could not help but look at his guest, an officer, and the blue uniform of the Luftwaffe. Several medals, some of which were from the Velkrieg and from West Russia. He had the good sense not to ask what his guests had done in such places. Sometimes it was best to only let military men talk if they wanted, and what, from what little he heard from them, he could understand why. Not to say the guests didn't talk as they drove into Porsche down the dusty road from Leopoldville to Cabinda. He did ask a few questions about the new pipeline that accompanied them along the way. How much could it transport, how long was it, and how, lo how thick were the walls? Once he had asked if about if the wildlife was impacted heavily by the pipeline and how deep it was under the ground. Still, the owner had no idea what the guests wanted from this trip. He figured that it was another investor wanting to put his money into one of the few bright spots of the packed economy. And he had those and he had those before, occasionally. He tried to put in a pitch about the profitability of the venture where to possibly buy stocks or bonds in the associated companies. The guest wasn't interested. As a new officer in the Central African Luftwaffe, he knew the entire endeavor relied upon a steadily and constant supply of oil from Cabinda. And he knew that this pipeline, regardless of profitability, would have an extremely large role to play, more than just good business, and I'm glad we got that one before the war started. Oh, why are we still in edit mode? Yeah, uh, this is really glitchy right now, but whatever. That was unexpected. If you like it about that, please go right ahead. Wow, we have an entirely new tree. Wow, I did not expect that at all. So, maybe we should help. Our fellow Afrikaner or or Afrikaner Rex Commissariats are preparing for the worst. An alliance of sorts has been created, the Africa Shield, aimed at keeping the German colonial empire under control. While well, the mainland Reich can't protect us any longer, and we have joined out of our obligations, and because Hutig threatened to have his SS storm Hitler stop. While well, his methods aren't rash as usual, his reasoning isn't entirely wrong this time. Our standing troops are a few too, too few to actually resist an organized revolt, or even worse, all-out war with a foreign power. And the Hale is too busy tearing itself apart to help. We need every able-bodied, or at least partially loyal man we can find. Perhaps we should start recruiting. Um, just in case. Oh, God dang it. Yeah, the game is really glitched sometimes with this stuff. I'm gonna throw everyone right here. Like, like that, or something like that. There you go. Um, wow. Man, when Hitler dies, everything just goes crazy. Look at all that stuff. Oh, baby. There goes Oslin. We're gonna need to raise military spending, probably. We have enough equipment for now, though, which looks pretty good. But, can I skip the natives? Hands off administration with conscripted natives? Yeah, I don't mind that one. Even with a regular garrison and the native SS fully mobilized, we're still too few. Too few. We need more soldiers than the native tribes we have struck agreements with are the perfect candidates for cheap, expendable troops. The promise of larger autonomy and exemption from diamond mining duty should convince them to send some of their warriors to us as auxiliary units. A new uniform and a couple of weeks of training will be enough, and or they'll be perfectly ready to fight, or at least, that's our hope. Review our land and air forces. As Steiner's helicopter roared above the landing pad, he could see a panic in the tropes below as they struggled to throw themselves into the semblance of order. Some of the black faces staring up at him looked frozen in fear. Steiner wasn't sure whether it was because they exactly knew who he was or because they'd never seen a helicopter before. As the craft touched down, the band struck up the first notes of Haya Safari. Steiner's first sight was the back of an SS officer struggling to keep hold of his cap and make sure himself heard above the deafening rotor blade roar as he barked at his men in German, pleading with them to close ranks. Their only response was a curious stare until their native C NCOs in actuality. Descendants of local tribal royalty echoed the order in Lingala. The depth of Steiner's frown after observing the sorry sight eclipsed them even deep, flat notes of the trumpets struggling to amble their way through the tune. 
That's pretty sad. In the capital, things have been going well, though. The parades in Leopoldville for the press and the shield observers show the pride of Central Africa. Men sporting the neat, neatest uniforms, the latest equipment, the crispest salutes above the skies of Point Noir. Shield pilots exercising dizzying air-to-air -air maneuvers, dazzling the stunned international onlookers below. Collectively, they had done an excellent job at fooling the Reich, fooling the South Africans, and fooling the world into thinking they were an effective, well-ordered military force, but gazing on this mass of half-clothed men, standing in front of a decrepit BF-109, converted into a crop dust. Steiner began to wonder if they had fooled themselves, too. As the press speculated on what Wunderwaffe could be hiding deep in the jungles of Zensor Africa, Steiner was one of the few who knew the tr sad truth. The only military secrets lingering about here were how little training or motivation these local troops had to move over to the next village. Much as down to the front line. Today in the jungle, tomorrow the world. Can skip the mercenaries? We'll do... Uh, maybe we should organize. The sudden lack of supplies from the mainland Reich has revealed our Achilles heel. With their lack of proper infrastructure and military facilities, we're simply incapable of producing enough weapons and ammo to keep our armed forces well supplied in times of peace, let alone during an actual war. If we want to resist in the event of a conflict, we should desperately need to increase our production rates and improve our logistical infrastructure to minimize losses. Maybe we should start having stop having hunts and parades and actually start organizing. And the shield goes to war immediately. Oh god. The calls come out from Quillemaine. Nita Stossen. Um Ost African divisions begin to advance on the South African border while fighters and bombers take off from remote runways. The contingency plans that colonial officers have been drafting for years will finally be put into effect, while news of the invasion is yet to reach the general public. Our press office is currently preparing a statement to be read by the Rex Commissar on all radio stations. In the meantime, the mobilization of the anti-aircraft units and reserve garrisons around our major cities will surely attract attention. We must strike the South Africans quickly and with overwhelming strength. The Africa Shield is going to war and victory will be ours. The Krieg und Sieg. Actually, how much longer do we have for this? Seven days? Eh, we can wait. A nice getaway. Despite the unexpected circumstances, Hans and Amelia still endure the sights of Hitlerstadt. Hotel management said they only needed to stay in Central Africa for a couple more weeks than they expected. Once the unrest back home died down, they assured all will be back to normal. Until then, the young couple spent their days lounging by the pool, going on safari, enjoying the Congo's hidden delights. All expenses paid for, of course. Their neighbor muttered incessantly about his factory in Dusseldorf, but he was so dull the best of times, the two did their best to ignore him. They were enjoying gourmet uh, prepared by the hotel restaurant that night. Hans was just joking with a pair of Swedish businessmen who were flying out the next morning. And if you can scour the gunpowder from the lettuce dirt, it's fine a place for growing wheat. Laughter, then every light in the restaurant cut out. A moment later, a man in the officer's uniform stormed from the doorway. Ladies and gentlemen, he panted, if you could please fall a long, low sound, like a screech rendered in slow motion, cut off the intruder's voice from far overhead. It echoed through the dining room as a Hitlerstadt tourist screamed. It sounded like rolling thunder. Oh boy. Yeah, we better go to war now. I hope we don't lose all the resources. Um, well. God dang it. Uh, where, where's, where are the divisions? What the heck? Oh, we can see our allies there. Oh, this is so glitch. Hold on, give me one moment, please. Oh, Alright, everyone, so I fixed it up, so now we can actually see where our divisions are at. I'm just gonna go and concentrate our area around here, hopefully. We'll see what happens. Hopefully we do okay. Obviously, there's no guarantee. I would really like to cut these guys off as fast as we possibly could, though. That would be our pretty much our main goal right now, because we're beating them up right here, which is actually really, really awesome. So, a lunch to remember. It was a moment a, a long he had longed for. Every day he reported to the mine well before daybreak and counted the hours until the whistle signaled lunch in the dark. Subterranean gloom. The break was a welcome reprieve, his daily chance to see the sun. Dropping his pick and wiping his brow, he shambled towards the crowd bunched by the elevator and waiting his turn to ride up and feel the warm rays on his sweat-soaked clothes. What he saw on the surface only made him sweat more. Mr. Peters, a foreman, stood next to a white man wearing a uniform, a long he had never seen, certainly no guard. As the miners left the elevator, the stranger counted them off one by one. Every tenth man was pulled aside by two soldiers. A long he breathed a sigh of relief when he heard noise as he stepped off the platform, but suddenly the stranger raised his hand and the guard tore a long from his place in the line, pushing him towards the truck. You dude, we had an agreement. Every tenth man for your quota picked at random. Peters broke in German belied his rage, but the stub of... Sturmbahnführer only smirked. I need good soldiers for the Reich, not hospital wards. The one behind him won't last three weeks. This one is strong. This colony won't last three weeks if you take all my best men, the German officer stiffened. Well, then, Mr. Peters, perhaps you'd like to return to your, to your family in Europe? I hear Burgundy is much more temperate this time of the year than the Congo. Officially, the penalty for insufficient enthusiasm among the Belgians was tra transportation home. In reality, Steiner was a merciful man. He simply had the dissenter shot. As a chill ran down his spine, Peters acquiesced. He watched Longi and the others carted off to the front line, likely to never see their homes again. That makes two of us, he muttered under his breath in French as his trucks rolled by. It seems diamonds aren't forever after all. And we're going to do, maybe we should organize. And let's go and do one more focus too. Uh, fortify the border. 
Oh, let's do this one. That seems like pretty pretty good. Draw plans. Our army needs a plan. Not just a plan, but the plan. A comprehensive effort to fully prepare for any eventuality which may befall us. We need to make a proper inventory of our armed force, supplies, and strategic assets to assess our strong and many more weak points to understand what must be done and be ready to do it without hesitation. We shall send officers, bureaucrats, prospectors, and around the Rex Commissariat, and they'll send us regular reports about our mobilization efforts, listing all needed improvements and suggested methods. Do we have an air force? No, we don't. God dang it. We literally have no planes. Well, Cradola. Keep going, guys. You're doing great. Cut these guys off as fast as you possibly can. Go, 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 go. We have cut them off. Well, it's only two divisions, but whatever. Ah, actually, no, it's three. There you go. Help support the attacks as well. Oh, go up there then. Go, go, go. Nice. Oh, there's maybe three of your. Nice. And we got them. Not too... Wow, they're actually really pushing down hard, but... Rolf Steiner was slamming the door shut when he entered the Rex Commissar's office with a mess of folders pinched above his armpit. While slamming it shut from the standpoint of his usual behavior, he glanced at his jovial superior with a stern look, whose response was to face a glee and mocking salute. Look at this pile of incomprehensible crap, Rex Commissar. The minister was saying grimly while letting the duckwings fall under the table, triggering an awkwardly noisy bump on the wooden table. Don't look at this if you want to keep something of your military intellect. This is right here is the incarnation of its absence. I can tell you that whoever was involved in this being possible has to be given a new assignment. Mueller stared at the looking at started looking at the covering sheets of the many folders and papers. Meanwhile, the minister added a comment he mumbled to himself through his gritted teeth, and even though I prefer harsher punishment, Mueller straightened himself and looked at his colleague. He tilted his head and made an urging gesture with his hand. You said so yourself. Don't expect me to read it. Clear me up. I already began wondering to what took you so long. He added a sly smile to his last remark. Steiner took a deep breath and bit his lip. Our chain of command, Rex Commissar, is the most incomprehensible and dumbest mess I've ever seen. And I've been part of the Cameroon conflicts. Anyway, there are flocks of isolated commander groups that seem to have never communicated with each other since their existence. Furthermore, the command structure within the Waffen SS seems somewhat fine. However, don't let me begin with the clutter that the chain of command is when both the SS and the structuralist garrison, led by generals that might not, not have seen his fight since the Second World War, are operating. Now add mercenaries, the clique of a certain general, and the different branches of the Central African military to the equation. The Rex Commissar's smile had vanished. Well, crap. This is quite untimely to be discovered only now. He shook his head to underline this while to fix this immediately. And I just know the right person for the job, and which we're going to conclude today's episode with drawing plans. But you know what? We'll read one more because we can fortify the border. Well, the southern and eastern borders protected by the I or other Rex Commissariats. I don't trust Utig, but I pray he won't attack us right now. This leaves our northern border open to raids from the tribes living in what was once a place of anarchy kept under the boot of the Lufafa. We should prevent any conflict from spilling inside our lands by erecting a line of light fortifications and frontier outposts along the border, hoping it'll be enough to protect us from the coming storm. <clears throat> But before we go, we have a total of 60 divisions in our little group here. They have up to 40 max. They've already lost 24,000. We've only lost 73, 73 guys. But I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow as we hopefully take out South Africa. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.